Good morning, everybody, and Chodesh Tov. Thank you for joining us on this lovely Rosh Chodesh Adar, Friday morning, Erev, Shabbat Mishpatim. This Shabbat, we have an amazing Shabbat ahead of us. We have, first of all, Perashat Mishpatim, the weekly Perasha. That's one Sefer Torah. We have Rosh Chodesh again tonight and tomorrow, Shabbat. So that's a second Sefer Torah. And we have an extra reading called Shabbat Shekalim, Perashat Shekalim. We read a small paragraph from Perashat Kitisa that deals with the Machatzit HaShekel. And that is a third Sefer Torah. So a lot, a lot going on tomorrow. Um, join your synagogue. Obviously stay safe. Make sure that we are following the guidelines, Bezat Hashem, uh, so that we can all rejoice in a happy and safe and responsible way. Rabotai, the month of Adar, as we enter the month of Adar, our rabbis tell us that we have to be extra happy. And again, thank you for today's sponsors. Today's class is sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shalem Avol Vam Yisrael. As well, today's class is sponsored by Carol Menesh Leilu Nishmat, her husband, Marty Menesh. Mordechai ben Esther, Ruach Hashem, Tanihenu Began Eden. Rabotai, we are entering the month of Adar. And the month of Adar is always ushered in with the reading of Perashat Shekalim. Okay? And we're going to talk today about this Perasha, Perashat Shekalim, a very interesting uh, paragraph. What is a shekel? Shekel is a coin, it's a currency. Today we use dollars. Quarters, dimes, nickels. Back then, they used shekel. That was the currency. And the Torah tells us, uh, the Mishnah tells us in Masichet Shekalim, that every single uh, Adar, the first of Adar, we, sh- we collect for the Bet HaMikdash, they would collect, because, you know, in the Bet HaMikdash, they had, to, they had to pay. They had to pay to buy animals, right? Not all the animals were donated, Sometimes they had to bring their own. Where are they going to get the money from? For the wood, for all of these things. There's a lot of, it's expensive to run a Beit HaMikdash, <laughs> as you all know. So to, so to keep, to pay for all of the expenses, once a year, everybody had to donate. Make sense? Okay, like membership. To be part of a synagogue, you have to pay membership so that the shul can pay for its expenses. Well, in the Beit HaMikdash, the membership, if you were Jewish, it was a half shekel. Whatever that's worth, everybody would give half a shekel, and that was it. And from that money, they would pay for all of the korbanot of the upcoming year. Okay, so we read about, today, we read on Shabbat tomorrow, we're going to read about the shekel. We're going to read this paragraph from the Sefer Torah. So besides for the weekly perasha, perashat mishpatim, we're going to read about the collecting, the annual collection that was used for the bet. Hamikdash. And like we said, the collection begins now, beginning tomorrow. They would collect Rosh Chodesh Adar, and that collection would go all the way. And that's why we begin reading the Shekalim tomorrow, uh, okay, on Rosh Chodesh Adar. Now, the question is, why did they collect now? You could collect at any time of the year, right? They could have collected in, I don't know. Tishrei, Feshvan, Kislev, Tevet. Why do they collect an Adar? So simply, Nisan is the new year. Right? Nisan is the new year. And the animals that were sacrificed from next year, Nisan, beginning in Nisan, have to be from new money that was meant for that year, 2021. So they would have to, uh, they would have to collect the money. And it, they assume it takes a month to collect. So if you're collecting and it takes a month to collect, We'll collect from the first of Adar. We'll be done collecting by Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And now we'll have all of the money for the entire year to last us from this Nisan till next year, Nisan. Okay, beautiful, very simple. Of course, nothing is ever so simple. There is a beautiful Gemara. Take a look. And I'm, what, I'm, what, what we're going to study today is from Rabbi Bernstein's book on the uh, Megillat Esther. Again, Purim is just two weeks away. So if you didn't get a Purim book yet, uh, great time to go today. Pick up a, a Purim book. Uh, I picked up one from the Judaica store just a couple of days ago. Right, Bernstein's Removing the Mask. Okay, Removing the Mask. Excellent book. It is in English. Okay, it is in English. And by the way, um, 
by the way, uh, he, his Chumash book, uh, there is no Chumash book yet because it's being written. Okay, so that will come out in a, a soon, hopefully. In the meantime, he does have on the Megillot, he has on certain holidays. So uh, fantastic, excellent stuff. A lot of what we're going to say today is stuff that we know um, from other things, but it's beautiful to see how he puts a lot of it uh, together. Okay, uh, one second. Yes, the collection of uh, Half Shekel was not made for census purposes. Uh, it was made for census purposes in the Midbar, with Moshe Rabbeinu. But that's not why we collected forever, right? It was more so that we can use it for the Korbanot, okay? In the Midbar with Moshe, it was for census purposes, okay? Good point. But that was not why it was collected throughout history, okay? For, from then on, it wasn't for the census. Now, there is a very interesting Gemara. To understand the Gemara, we have to go and study a little bit Megillat Esther. So here we go. And it is the season. So here we go. Let's go into Purim mode. Haman wants to destroy and annihilate the Jewish people. Right? We all know the story. He wants to kill all of the Jews. So he goes over to Haman, uh, to Achashverosh, to the king. And to try to persuade the king, to try to convince Achashverosh to, to annihilate the Jews, he bribes him. And he gives him a lot of money. The Megillah says... I will weigh out 10,000 talents of silver for deposits into the king's treasuries, right? Into, um, into any uh, non-profit organization that you would like, Achashverosh, I'll make a donation in your name, 10,000 talents, okay? Just kill the Jews. Now, regarding this statement, the Gemara says, Amar Resh Lakish, Resh Lakish says, it was revealed and known to the master of the universe. That one day Haman, in the future, would weigh out Shekalim for the purposes of killing all of the Jews. And therefore, Hikdim Shkalehim Lishkalav. And therefore, Hashem preceded Haman, he beat him to it. Before you give your coins, God says, I will command my children to give their coins. And therefore, they gave Shekalim, and what you did will have no power. And this is a fantastic statement. In other words, in addition to the halakha, that we give the Shekalim, because we need the new money for Nisan, and it's a month in advance, so there's no better time to start collecting than now. There is another reason why we give Shekalim, in the month of Adar, says Resh Lakish, because it's in the month of Adar that Purim happens, that Haman wants to kill us, and the miracle happens, and we were saved because of the mitzvah of Machatzit HaShekel. That's what Resh Lakish is saying, that uh, the, the Shekel is what saved us. And the obvious question that we have to study today is what in the world is the connection between the Shkalim that we gave to over the Beta Mikdash? And Haman wanting to kill us and the money that he gave. In other words, how is the mitzvah of Machatzit HaShekel an antidote to the destruction of the Jewish people in the time of Haman? And to understand how it was a solution, Rabotai, we of course have to take a step back and ask ourselves first, what was the problem? What was the problem in the time of Haman? We know that any decree that's down here is not ever ever stamped unless God approves it. And if Haman was going to annihilate us, our rabbis wonder, we ask, what is it that we did wrong to deserve almost near destruction? And if we open the Megillah again, we will find another Pasuk. And this is from Rav El Kabetz, the Manot HaLevi. Says of Shlomo El Kabetz, the author of, by the way, what, anyone know what very famous thing he wrote? Rav Shlomo El Kabetz. For Shlomo el Kabetz, you all know the song. Lecha Dodi Likrat Kala. Okay, he is the author. Lecha Dodi, whatever tune you sing it in. But it's amazing. Ashkenaz, Sfaradi, doesn't matter. We all sing those, wor those, those words. We sing it. The author of that song is Rav Shlomo el Kabetz. And if you pay attention, it spells out his name in the beginning of each line. Shamor Vezachor, Shamor Shin. Okay, Likrat Shabbat Lamid. Okay, anyways, it spells out his, his name, Shlomo. 
and uh, his last name was El Kabetz. He lived 500 years ago. The t- he was a Mekubal. He lived in the time of the Arizal, the time of the Shulchan Aruch of Yosef Cairo in uh, in Safat. So it was um, it was a golden uh, era for for, uh, for, uh, for for Torah. Says the uh, Manot Halevi. If we open the Megillah, Haman comes and he says to Achashverosh when they're having that conversation, and he says to him, Yeshno am echad. Mefuzar umforad ben ha'amim. There is a nation that is mefuzar umforad. What does that mean? Anyone know? What's mefuzar umforad? Mefuzar umforad means there is a nation that is scattered and separate. And the obvious question is, what is, we have to ask, because the Megillah is able, we're able to ask questions because it was written through prophecy, through Ruach HaKodesh. What is Haman intending when he uses mefuzar umforad? They were scattered and they were mefurad, scattered. Just two ways of saying the same thing, no? Says of Shlomo el no, they're two different things. Mefuzar means scattered. Mefurad means separate. Mefuzar is a geographical concept. They're scattered geographically. Mefurad is they are separate. Meaning, meaning. One thing is they are scattered. They're not in the same place, so it'll be very easy, Ahasuerus, to kill them. But also, Meforad, they are separate. Amongst themselves, there is discord and there is a lack of unity among the Jewish people. Why does Haman mention this? Why should Ahasuerus care what is the uh, level of community or love that exists amongst the Jews. Why does Haman, the first point that they're scattered is important. Because again, Achashverosh is nervous. What if they rebel? What if they fight back? No, 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 no. They're scattered. We can wipe them out in, in, in one minute. Okay. Well, what about Meforad? What is that? Uh, what is that? What concern was that uh, alleviating? Says of Shlomo El Kabetz. Because Achashverosh and Haman knows this. Achashverosh will only go ahead with the plan if it's a short success. I don't want to gamble this. This is, a big, this is a big deal to annihilate people. I can't mess this up. Haman, are you sure it's going to work? After all, the Jewish people do have a good track record of getting divine assistance. I don't know that we want to now mess with God. You know what Haman says? Haman points out to Achashverosh, don't worry. There is strife. There is fighting. There is mahloket. There is a lack of connection between them. Even Haman knew. It, look at this, Rabotai. Even Haman knew that when there's a lack of unity, it leads to vulnerability and it leads to destruction of the Jewish people. And this is a concept that we've spoken about so many times. When there is shalom, we can exist. We can live, we can thrive. And when there's machloket, for example, for example, the generation of Noah. Noah. What did they do wrong? What did they do wrong? They stole from each other. What was God's response? Destroy them. One story later, Noah comes out of the uh, out of the ark. Then there's a generation that builds the tower of Babel against God. Migdal Bavil. What was their crime? Their crime was the worst crime in the entire Torah. Avodah Zarah. They tried going against Hashem, and what was God's response? He simply dispersed them. Doesn't the crime not seem to fit with the punishment? Noah's generation, they did a very bad thing. And how does God respond? Uh, excuse me, Noah's generation did a very light thing. And God responds with destruction. The generation of the, of the tower did a very bad thing. And God responds with not destruction. How could it be? The answer is, uh, what rabbis point out, because the, yes, Noah's time, it wasn't so bad, but there was no unity. They were stealing from each other. And that's the number one ingredient that could destroy people. And that will bring the world down. Haman knew this. Haman knew that if we have fighting, we'll be able to be destroyed. So he says to Achashverosh, Yeshno amehad mefuzar umforad. They are separate geographically, and they are also separate and divided amongst themselves on a national level. And therefore, they are vulnerable, will be able to take them down. 
which is why he says Rav Shlomo El Kabetz. The first thing that Esther says when she wants to go in and to bring about a salvation, and she's going to go in and speak to Achashverosh, let's save the day, uh, right? And she's going to do it. What's the, what is her commandment? What's her instruction to Mordechai? Esther says to her uncle, to Mordechai, Lech kenos et kol hayehudim. Go and gather the Jewish people. Of course, she was saying to gather them and to fast. But she emphasizes and gather the Jewish people because if we want to remove this problem, if we want to work on a salvation, no initiative of mine will ever work unless we cure the problem at its roots. The problem was the, uh, divide, being divided. The solution has to be that we come together. Lech kenos, go and round up, reunite, and then we will deserve Hashem's protection from Haman again. And so they do. They do, they connect, they reunite, and they are, and when they are faced with a common enemy, the Jewish people are able to put aside all of the differences and to be able to, uh, to connect and to, to find the ability to reunite as a people. You know, Mordechai, and this is something beautiful that, that Rabbi Bernstein says over here. So far was the Rosh Shlomo El Kabetz. Rabbi Bernstein, though, he adds over here. When Haman's decree was overturned after that magical night, and, Hama, and Achashverosh kills Haman, well, the problem is that there's still a decree that was sent out that in, um, in 11 months from now, all the Goyim should kill the Jews. So even though we killed Haman, you know, most of us, we hear, they killed Haman, and we say, ah, the story's over. No, 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 no. And maybe, you know, we should do a study on the Megillah, because I don't think many of us realize actually what happened. After Haman's killed, this problem is still there. Haman, let's, let's take a step back, okay? Haman wants to kill the Jews. What month does the story take? Anyone know what month? Nine out of ten people get this wrong. What month does the story of Purim take place in? The whole story that we read, the majority of the story. That Haman wants to kill the Jews, Mordechai is not bowing down, Esther goes in, she says to the king, he can't sleep. When does that whole take place? Anyone know? Everyone's scared to answer. Okay, it takes place in the month of Nisan. Okay, I'll tell you why most of us don't think that. Okay, we, we probably thought Adar, right? Well, take a look. That's not what happened. In the month of Nisan, Haman had it. He wants to kill all the Jews. So he does a lottery. When should I kill them? And the lottery falls out that you should kill them in 11 months from now. Adar 13. Which is going to be in two weeks, right? The fast. So in two weeks, that's when the lottery fell out to kill the Jews. Okay. They sent out the letters to all the nations to kill the Jews in, in 11 months from now. Mordechai finds out. He says to Esther, hello, you got to do something. Esther's like, well, I mean, we have 11 months. Let's wait. Let's think about this. No, go into the king's office. Go in there. Go into the king's chamber. He's going to kill me. Let me wait. He's going to call me in soon. And when he calls me in soon, then I'll speak to him. I'll ask him. No, you have to go now. And she goes in that day. Right, she fasts for three days and then she goes in. And that fast, again, that whole story, it took place on actually Pesach. That year, the Jewish people fasted on Passover. Not all the Jews, but the ones that lived in Shushan near Esther. They fasted on, Pes on Passover. That is what happened. And she goes in and the magic happens that night that the king can't sleep, and then they take Haman, on, um, Haman takes Mordechai on the horse the next day, and then they kill Haman the day after that, right? That's all in the holiday of Pesach. That's when the miracle of Purim happened. But now, we kill Haman, but there's still a decree there that in 11 months from now, we should kill all the Jews. So they have to send out another decree. And then the second, uh, the second letter says, the second letter says, that Mordechai instructs the Jewish people. This is in the Megillah. It's, a, it's chapter 8, Pasuk 13. 
The Megillah says that all of the Jewish people, Mordechai warns them, all of the Jews should be atidim. What's atidim? Anyone know? Prepared. All of the Jews be prepared. Be prepared. Okay? Be prepared, says Mordechai, to exact vengeance from your enemies. Defend yourself. If any goy comes to kill you, there's another letter from the king telling the Jews to defend themselves. You have the National Guard on your side. Okay? Well, something very interesting in the Megillah. If you look in the Megillah, the word atidim, which means prepare, prepare to defend yourselves. Atidim, which is spelled ayin, taf, yod, dalet, yod, mem, is actually not spelled like that. Anyone know how it's spelled in the Megillah? It's spelled not with a yud. It's spelled with a vav. And it has to be spelled like that. It's spelled a tu dim. The Hazan will read it a tidim, which means prepared. But there is something that we call and we find throughout the Torah a kare uchtiv. Anyone know what that means? Kare uchtiv is it's written one way and it's read another. It's written atudim, but it's read atidim. And if the chazan reads it the wrong way, we correct him. What's the reason of this? Says the Maharal, well, atudim actually means something. Atidim means to be prepared. What does atudim mean? Atudim means, actually, atud, the Maharal says, is a goat. And it's a specific type of goat. It's a, it's a goat whose job it is to ensure that the rest of the flock stays together. How amazing is that? So Mordechai sends a message, number one, atidim, prepare yourself. But number two, the way to prepare yourself is atudim, like the goats, to get together. Because the message of Lech Kenos of Esther was a message that only reached the ears of the Jews in Shushan. They were the ones that fasted. But the message for the rest of the Jews in the rest of the world, Mordechai had to hint in the Megillah, and he does that by writing, Atudim, make sure to remove the de de decree of Haman to destroy us. We have to Atudim ourselves, we have to unite ourselves. Again, a beautiful Chidush that uh, Bernstein brings over here from the Maharal of this idea that it was the unity that ensures that we were saved and our salvation came from above. And so, again, they do, they, uh, they, they unite. And something very interesting that we find in the Megillah and throughout the entire theme of Purim and the song about it is Vena HaFochu. Those are two very famous words that we need to know. Vena HaFochu. Vena HaFochu means, and it was turned over. Right? The story of Purim is filled with irony how certain things that we thought would be to our detriment ended up being the very thing that saved us. Venahafochu. You thought this was going to hurt you. That's exactly where our salvation came from. It's an amazing concept. And again, it takes over the... Uh, it's, it's one of the main themes of the holiday of Purim. But just an example of where we see this so clearly. Haman is the one who wants to kill the Jewish people. And again, why does he feel entitled to kill the Jews? Why does he feel that he'll succeed in killing the Jews? What gives Haman the confidence to kill the Jewish people? What does he tell Achashverosh? Mefuzar umforad. They're very scattered. And he, he decides to attack us because we're divided. And the irony is of Purim, v'nahafochu. That very act of wanting to kill us is what brought us together. It's because of his decree that the Jewish people united. That there's that Mordechai realizes we have to do something. That Esther realizes, let's all connect. Let's make peace. And that is one of the reasons why um, we have on Purim the mitzvah of Mishloach Manot. The mitzvah of Mishloach Manot, again, is not just a nice mitzvah to give people food. Why do we have on, mitzvah, on Purim specifically? We don't have such a mitzvah on Hanukkah. We don't have a mitzvah like this on Rosh Hashanah. When it comes to Purim, send gifts. 
Why? Send food? Well, on a simple level, says the Trumat Adeshin, because we want to ensure that everybody has enough food for the Seuda. And it may be embarrassing to give your friend Tzedakah. What, what, what are you giving me Tzedakah? You think I'm poor? I don't need your handouts. So therefore, the rabbis instituted a mitzvah. It's not, it's not Tzedakah. I'm giving you Mishlach Manot. This way, it's a, it's a way of secretly being able to give someone who doesn't have Mishloach Manot and preserving their dignity so this way they could have food for the Mishteh, which is one of the mitzvot of Purim. But maybe on a deeper level, based on the Manot HaLevi, we could say that the reason we have to give food to one another is because that is how we are going to increase the feelings of Achdut, the feelings of friendship and camaraderie from one person to another. Um, matter of fact, if this is the case, it makes most sense not to send Mishlach Manot to your best friend, not to send Mishlach Manot to your sibling or to someone that you are very close to. Mishlach Manot is to achieve the exact opposite. It's about finding that one person that we don't like, that one person that we're in a fight with, that neighbor, that friend, maybe that family member, uh, someone acquainted that we know, and to send them a Mishlach Manot Listen, you know, let bygones be bygones. I'm sorry for what I did. You know, we were kids. We were immature. Let us just, you know, put it behind us and let's move forward. And this is from me to you. Um, I'll never forget a story that I shared in the Pekka Vogue class just a, a few nights ago. When I was um, living in Israel, um, uh, somehow, long story short, um, we got into a, a, a bit of a dispute with one of our neighbors in our building, believe it or not. Um, basically, my, my, um, when we moved back, when we came back to America for Sukkot, <laughs> I'll never forget the story. We moved back to, uh, we lived in Israel and we came to America for Sukkot. So we wanted to rent out our apartment. There are many people from all over the world that spend Sukkot in Israel. They're looking to rent a house for a couple of weeks. So we rented our house to an Argentinian family. Um, just to be able to help pay the rent for that month, help pay maybe for the tickets to come back to, to the States for the holiday of Sukkot. Either way, um, in the middle of Cholam Moed, I got a phone call from this uh, person who's renting for me. And he says, um, uh, Rabbi Mizrahi, I uh, just want to let you know, your neighbor came from upstairs and they took back their table. I'm like, what do you mean they took back their table? <laughs> He's like, I don't know, he just came in and took your, he took your kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you let someone take my kitchen table? What do you, what's your... Anyways, he gets the guy on the phone from upstairs and uh, the guy starts screaming at me. It's my table. I gave it to this family before you even moved here uh, five years ago and I'm here to take it back. And, um, uh, you know, I, I wasn't sure what he's talking about because, like, you know, I moved in and it wasn't even my apartment. It was someone that I was renting from. Um, so, so... You know, anyways, I, I find out that he ends up giving this table five years ago. And um, it was true. He gave it to, to the family there. And he was basically using my house as storage to keep the table there until he needed it again. <laughs> and, um, and now he needed it for, Sukkot, for his sukkah. So it was very convenient. And he walked into my house and just took the table. Anyways, I told him, you know, it's your table, but there's a way to do it. You don't just walk into someone's house and take it. Um, anyways, we got into a very big fight. Um, and that was it, you know, I, we went back to Israel after Sukkot and um, a few months later was Purim time and me and my wife were sitting down and we were going through our list of who we should give Mishlach Manot to and, uh, you know, the two people in the whole of Israel that we knew. Anyways, my wife goes like this and I look at her, I'm like, Hashem, we want, you want to give to Hashem? <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 no. And she's pointing upstairs, and I know exactly what she was talking about. And I'm like, Frida, don't even go there. I am not giving to the guy upstairs. And she's like, Ariel, you have to, you have to, you have to. That's the mitzvah. That's what Mishlach Manor is all about. And she made the Mishlach Manor. And I'll never forget, walking up those flight of stairs was the most difficult steps that I ever had to take. You know, to be able to be humble, to put aside our ego. To go over to somebody and, you know, to knock on the door. And it took so much. I went up the stairs. I came back down the stairs. I went up five times. Maybe I'll take the elevator. And I finally mustered up all the strength that I had. And I knock on the door. And the guy opens up. 
And I'm standing there with it, and I'm like pr practicing. What am I going to say? He's going to kick me out. He's going to yell at me. Of course, he did none of that. He opens the door and he looks at me. He smiles. He says, Mizrahi, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, I, 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 sh I, sh I shouldn't have. And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, keep going, keep going. <laughs> and of course, we apologized. And uh, he came with his Mishloach Manot. And I'm like, uh, where should I put the Mishlach Manot? So he goes, put it on the table. <laughs> Either way, um, uh, you know, this is what the mitzvah is all about, Rabotai. This is what Purim is about. Mishlach Manot ish from one man to another, to find that one person that maybe we said something inappropriate to, or that they said something inappropriate to us. But you know what? We have to forgive. And... Um, our rabbi said in Perkei Avot, Heve makdim shalom lechol adam. Always initiate hello to someone else. But our rabbi said something deeper. The Baalei Musar say shalom also means peace. Be the first to initiate peace. Don't have a mishloach mano prepared. If they come, then I'll give back. No, no, no. Make the drive, take the walk to their house, find them, initiate, send the platter to their house, and figure out a way. This is the mitzvah rabotai of Purim. And it was Haman that achieved it. Haman was the one that got us together. Matter of fact, we know Haman is given the title. Anyone know what Haman was called? He is called Haman Ha'agagi, but what else is he called? He is known in the Megillah, and we refer to him as Tzorer HaYehudim. Anyone know what that means? Tzorer HaYehudim? Tzorer means the oppressor of the Jews. This is a, Megillah, this is a concept that's re, it, it's in the Megillah. Chapter 8, Pasuk 1, the Megillah calls Haman Tzorer HaYehudim, the oppressor of the Jews. But you know what else Tzorer means? Tzorer also means Tzoror. Tzoror is a bundle. Haman Tzorer HaYehudim, the one who bundled up the Jewish people, who one who brought us together. Unfortunately, it is a reality. That when we have an enemy, the enemy is able best to bring us together. Like what our rabbi said, all of the prophets, all of the Nevi'im, they couldn't accomplish what Haman did with one removal of the ring from the king's finger. One tiny decree of an enemy brought the Jews back together closer than all of the prophets could have ever done. And, uh, and this is, the again, the message of Purim. The idea of remembering that we are a community. Rabotai, what does it mean to be a community? You know, a community is not only that we live in the same, um, in the same part of, of, of a town. Being part of a community involves much more than the practical aspect of joining together and participating in uh, the communal endeavors, being part of the same synagogue. It's much more than that. Being a community, Rabotai, um, again, we look into the Megillah. And Esther says, Tsumu alai. When she's ready to go to speak to the king, and again, she's risking her life, because you do not go to the king's office uninvited. What do you mean? She's his wife. This is Persia, honey. This is Persia 2,000 years ago. You do not go to the king's office. I don't care if you're his first wife or his second wife or his tenth wife. And Esther is, is scared for her life. And so she says, listen, um, fast for me. Tzumu, shloshet yamin, three days, day and night. And I'll do the same, I'm going to fast. Which is again, a hard thing to imagine. You're going to go to the king. You want to be full in color. You want to be red cheeks. You want to have all of your strength with you. If you fast for three days, Esther, you're going to be very pale. That's not the most advisable thing to do before you go and you speak to your husband, the king, and ask him to remove a decree. You want to be as attractive as possible. You want your husband to really, really be, you know, infatuated as you're approaching him. To fast is counterintuitive. But that's what she does. She fasts for three days. And she says to the Jews, Tsumu alai, fast for me for three days. Shloshet yamim layla vayom. But she adds a very interesting word. She doesn't say fast. She says, Tsumu alai. Fast for me. What does she mean by that? What is she trying to say when she says for me? But the answer is, again, if the issue is that we are 
if there is discord, if the issue is that there is um, that there is a lack of unity, then the response is to unite, to be a community. You know what it means to be a community? To think about the other person, to put their concerns before our own. And what I take a look at Esther, she says to the Jews, you're worried about getting killed in 11 months from now. Rightfully so. A decree just went out that you're going to get killed. I'm also worried about getting killed, but in three days from now. So you're worried about getting killed, and I'm not going to get killed because no one knew that Esther was Jewish. And I'm worried about getting killed of going in, and that's only going to affect me. You know what we should do? Let's switch. You fast, but not for yourselves getting killed. Fast for me. Tsumu alai. Put aside your own personal feelings and your concerns and put mine before yours. And I will do the same. I'll fast. And for three days, you know what I'll be thinking? Hashem, please save the Jews. Not Hashem, please save me. Putting the concerns of the Rabim, of the majority, before my own. Such a powerful concept. And uh, we find this in the Gemara, Masechet Rosh Hashanah. The Gemara says something very powerful. That a person could pray and could change their future. Right? A person is sick, they could pray. However, the Gemara says if there is a seal, if there was a verdict and it was decreed and it was stamped, then you cannot pray and remove it. Okay, an interesting concept. However, however, if you're praying with a tzibur, if you're praying with a community, which is why it's always important to go to shul, if you're praying with a community, then you can remove a decree, even if it was stamped. We got it? So again, alone, if it was stamped, you're not going to be able to remove it. With a community, then even if it was stamped, I could remove it. Well, the Gemara asks a question. Well, we know that there, are, there is a case. Sailors are at sea. And the Gemara says that if there was a decree, and their decree was sealed that they should drown, then it will not help if they prayed. Ask the Gemara, why not? Why won't it help if sailors pray? More likely than not, the sailors are all together. They're a community. Let them pray together, and they could together remove the decree. Why is sailors not? Why are sailors not able to pray? And the Gemara gives a very vague answer. The Gemara says because sailors are like individuals. What does that mean? Why are sailors like individuals? Why should they not be considered like a group of sailors, which is exactly what they are? And the answer is says the Shemesh Shmuel, because they are thinking of themselves, although. They are all in the same boat, <laughs> but they are thinking of themselves. Each one is praying for their own safety. Each one's praying that they should be, and therefore that makes them individuals. So a community, Rabotai, and take a look at this, this line from Rabbi Bernstein. A community is not a room that holds us together with others, but by the room that we make for others in our heart. How beautiful is that? Rabbi, could you say that again? Yes, I'll say it again. In other words, community is defined not by the room that holds us together with others, but by the room that we make for them in our heart. Beautiful idea. And that is the message, again, of Esther. Esther says, I'll think of you. I'll make room for you in my... And that's why, by the way, there is a very big segula. If you are praying for something, Let's say you're praying for a shiduch. Let's say you're praying for children. Let's say you're praying for business. There's a big segula to find someone in the same predicament. To find someone with the same problem. And you pray for them and they pray for you. Do you know that? Very powerful. If you need a marriage, pray for your friend who's looking for, to find the right one. If you need children, pray for your friend. Why? And the answer is, because if God forbid there is a decree against us, if our faith and our destiny was sealed that we shall not have children, we shall not get married, we shall not be successful in business, there is only one way to remove that, and that is as a community. And there is no better way to be a community than if I think of you and you think of me. Amazing. Very powerful thoughts. 
and 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 these and there are many organizations today. I mean, my wife, my wife told me a story. I forget the exact details, but um, but it's an organization that of I think it, it's uh, couples that are childless, and you pray for them. Um, you and you give them your name, and they pray for you. Um, my wife told me a story of a friend of hers that took upon one couple and this girl was praying for this couple to uh, have children and when she got the text that the wife is pregnant this girl that was praying for them found her shiduch it was in that same week something remarkable um, again i forget the exact details of the story but it's uh these these this is what it means to be a community and it works there is a beautiful story that rabbi bernstein brings on one occasion, the students of the Mir Yeshiva approached the Rosh Yeshiva, Eliezer Yehuda Finkel, and they asked that he raise their stipend, their monthly stipend. Um, they felt, you know, our stipend could barely cover our minimal costs. Rabbi, could you please help us out? Um, anyways, Rav Finkel sympathized with them, but he told them that he was not able to add the amount from the Yeshiva funds as the money was needed for other matters of the Yeshiva. The students persisted. They said, Rabbi, we really need it. And they insisted and insisted. And they even said, halachically, Rabbi, you have to give us what we want because we are the majority and you are an individual and majority rules. Oh my gosh, could you imagine saying that to the Rosh Yeshiva? It's actually this week's parasha. We should go after the majority. In order of you, Rav Finkel responded to the Rosh Yeshiva. Abotai. Actually, he said, that is not the case. It is true that there are more of you than there are of me. But each of you wants an increase of the stipend for your own needs. I am only one person, but my decision is to keep the funds out of concern for everyone in the yeshiva. Therefore, I am the majority and all of you are the individual and the halakha is like me. Isn't that beautiful? Again, you could be many, many people. It doesn't matter. If each one of you is only thinking about themselves, you're an individual. I am one person, but I am thinking about the yeshiva. I am the majority. And that is, that is what's going on on this ship. This ship is uh, in danger. It's about to be overturned, capsized at sea. And the Gemara says, all of the sailors, there could be millions of them, but they're like an individual because each one is praying for himself. Each one only cares that they themselves should be saved. And if that's the case, that's not called a community. Rabotai, go back to our original question and we'll end with this. What is the mitzvah of machatzit shekel? What is the point? Why do I give a half coin to the Bet HaMikdash? Of course, it's to, um, it's to be able to pay for the funds. But again, every mitzvah has a, a deeper a message that it's trying and a, a, a midah, an attribute that it's trying to instill into us. Every mitzvah is here to teach us something. What is the mitzvah of Machatita Shekel trying to teach us? And the idea of what I, our rabbis say is unity. If you take a look at the half coin, the Machatita Shekel, the Pasuk says, and we're going to read it tomorrow again, pay attention. Everyone gives a half. You cannot give more, you cannot give less. Your contribution is the same as everybody else's. We are all equally valid. We are all equally valuable. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how poor you are. No way of better ensuring a sense of community. Not only that, but how much do we give? We don't give one shekel each. We give half a shekel each. I alone am incomplete. I am only half the story. I am part of something that is much greater than I when I combine with someone else's half. Together, we are one. And that is what the Gemara means. Why do we begin the month of Adar with the reading of Shekalim? Haman came and he wanted to destroy us. And he gives Achashverosh a lot of money to do it. And God says, I know you. I see you. But I am going to make sure that I outdo you, Haman. And God commands us to give Shekalim way before Haman gives Achashverosh Shekalim. The decree of Purim, the decree of Haman, was because of uh, a lack of unity. And so God says, I will ensure that unity is instilled when we internalize the mitzvah of Machatzit HaShekel. And now it is all beautifully clear, I hope, 
how the mitzvah of Machatzit HaShekel connects so powerfully, so beautifully to the mitzvah of Purim. Again, um, as we read the Pirasha tomorrow, I hope that the Pirasha has that much more meaning. Um, the idea of Machatzit HaShekel, what it was meant to instill, and how again it is the antidote to the, uh, to the story of Purim and to the, to the annihilation of the Jewish people. May we be zocher to fulfill all the mitzvot of Purim, um, uh, the mitzvah of Mishloach Manot, the mitzvot of Mishteh, to realize what they are about so that we can again come together and Be'ezrat Hashem, the same way the Jewish people were saved in the time of Haman because of their connection, because of the love that they had for each other. We should be able to put aside our differences. We should not need a enemy like Haman or like Corona or any other enemy to bring us together. We should be able to do it on our own. And by doing so, we will be zochet to another redemption speedily and in our days. Amen.